our agenda for today you see on the screen we're going to go through brand loyalty just to cover what it is because we all have an, an essential understanding of it but let's make sure that we have the same definition then we're going to talk about how to measure brand loyalty and then we'll move into an action plan to try and increase brand loyalty so that's where we're headed today and with that let's take a look at some different points of view about brand loyalty and the first one that I want to share uh, comes from you see the guys on the screen whose names I'm going to share quotes from the first is from Kevin Roberts and Kevin uh, seems to be saying in this quote focus on the brand create a brand experience that is unforgettable and I don't think anyone who's in marketing would really argue with that we, we, we think that's a very desirable thing to do Byron who is the author of a book how brands grow has this to share and what he says seems to be a focus on the people because the, the brand's fine but without the people the brand is nothing and so you look at these and they might on the surface seem to be in opposition to one another but i really don't think they are i think they're actually much closer to being in agreement than these quotes might seem after an initial reading because isn't delivering a memorable brand experience focusing on the person who's a customer of the brand so we're going to talk about that in a little bit more detail today. Um, what I think these two points of view are really expressing is kind of maybe a chicken and egg dilemma when it comes to brand loyalty. Which comes first? Do you have to have a really awesome brand before people will get loyal to it? Or do you have to have a lot of customers in order for them to develop a loyalty to the brand? You know, I, I didn't really mean to go into a philosophical debate about that today, but uh, if you have an opinion, I'd love to hear it. You can share that with me. But let's take a look first at what's a brand loyalist? What, what does that really look like? Is a brand loyalist someone who just keeps buying from you? A person who buys the same brand repeatedly? Are they a brand loyalist? And, and I think that begs the question, do we have to know something about their motivation for doing that? So that's one possibility. I, I think a lot of us would agree, yeah, okay, someone who buys over and over, that's, that's probably a brand loyalist. loyalist. Uh, what about someone who really prefers the brand? So they like the brand and that's why they buy it. And, and so we then have to ask, okay, well then what, under what conditions would they switch? Um, if you're out, if, if, if you're out of stock of the brand that, that they prefer, do they go somewhere else to get it or do they just buy what's next to it on the shelf? So that, that could be a brand loyalist. Um, but let's keep going. Let's look at another definition. What about someone who's a brand defender? This is a person who, when challenged about a brand preference, they'll defend it. Um, so does that make them a brand loyalist? And I think we'd probably say, yeah, that's, that's a definition that we can agree on. Uh, the last one I want to share is this one, someone who's a brand ambassador. I mean, you got to love this graphic. I think we would all agree if you're willing to get one of your favorite brands tattooed on your body, that probably makes you either a, a real ardent brand supporter, or maybe you've just sold part of your body for advertising. But a person who is a brand ambassador, they're, they're like a crusader. They're on the offensive, essentially, in so many words, telling people, hey, you're an idiot if you don't choose this brand. So there's lots of definitions. Uh, any of these could be definitions, and we'll go into some of them in a little bit more detail, but I think it's a good place to start is to kind of understand what, what is the behavior of a brand loyalist. Let's look now at what brand loyalty looks like in the marketplace. And I'm going to put up a list of brand leaders as identified by Forbes magazine from 2012 and before I do that I just want you to ask yourself who do you think's on this list um, who is just the top five list what brands what companies made the list of brand loyalty leaders in 2012 well the first one probably isn't a big surprise when you think about it is Apple for their tablet computers the second one is Amazon also for their tablet computers so we kind of see a little theme going here now, the rest of these may also be a bit of a surprise. The first two, perhaps not, but the rest of them, I think, might be, because number three is, once again, Apple with their smartphone. Number four is Amazon, this time because of their online retail capabilities. And finally, number five is also Apple because of their computers. Uh, now, the list goes on, and I think uh, Twitter was on the list. Uh, about number nine or number 10, but I just think the top five are interesting. It's totally dominated by these two companies who I think whether you're one of their brand loyalists or not, if you look at them very closely, you have to agree 
yeah, there's a lot of brand loyalty there. So, so that's what it looks like. Let's, let's keep going on this and, and look a little bit further. In 2012, this also is data that comes from Forbes. Who are the top gainers? And let's just look at that list. The first one is Sephra. Uh, and these are the measurements that came from Forbes. Their brand loyalty index increased by plus 60. Starbucks made a big gain. Ford made a big gain. Samsung, with their smartphone, made a big gain, which is kind of interesting because you may remember last year there was this big legal dust-up between Samsung and Apple that resulted in a decision that favored Apple, and yet we see Samsung on the market and loyalty side seems to be coming out very well as a result of that. Uh, and then number five on the list is Costco. So those were the big winners from 2012. Now let's look at the, the big losers when it comes to brand loyalty. Um, and this list probably doesn't surprise very many of us. Netflix, big loser. I think many of us are familiar with what they've done to kind of lose some brand loyalists. Then there's Bing, followed by BlackBerry, followed by a company I confess I don't have any familiarity with. And lastly, uh, Flickr at number five. And, and certainly with the top three, if you followed their fortunes, in the marketplace, I think you can see the connection between their declining fortunes and brand loyalty. So this is just a picture of what it looks like in the marketplace for some companies who are really doing well and who aren't doing quite so well. So with that picture, let's move on and understand maybe a bit more about the process. And let's, let's look at where brand loyalty sort of enters the picture when it comes to this, the whole process in this value chain. And so let's begin with looking at what that is. And, and customers, when they become a customer, typically go through this set of phases. They have a need and they do the discovery. They consider solutions and make a decision. And, and then they go back and look at that decision they made. And so if you see how this applies to you and your business, we understand that some of the people who go through this process, they fall through. You don't get them. They go to your competitors. But some of them do become customers of yours. Uh, just because they become customers doesn't mean they immediately become brand loyalists. It's not till they get to the review stage and they look at their decision. Sometimes they have buyer's remorse. But other times they look at what they've done and they feel like they have made a great decision and that relationship that's the basis of brand loyalty begins to form. And so we get some people who become brand loyalists towards the end of this whole process. So that's where it occurs. Let's look at the value. What is it worth to have this happen? And the value of brand loyalty is very, very dramatic. If you take, for example, some brand loyal customers. These are ones that already have that loyalty to you and you increase their number. Um, it has a huge effect on profit for customers. So let's, let's just start with a base of brand loyal customers. We have profit per customer that's at a certain level uh, that we can calculate. And so we go in and we just increase the number of brand loyal customers by 5%. Not a huge increase, so it seems. That seems very doable, very realistic. Before I show you the data, what do you think the increase, the percentage increases on profit per customer if you're able to increase your base of brand loyal customers just by 5%? And the answer may surprise you, and that is it increases between 25 and 100% profit for, per customer. So if you're looking for the business case to invest in increasing brand loyalty, you don't have to look past this information right here, which I've listed the source. It comes from a book written by Frederick Reichel. So the, the value and the power of this financially is huge. So let's keep going to look at what brand loyalty is. And, and I think we have to understand as marketers that, of course, it's, it's about more than just the logo. What brand loyalty really is, is it begins with an experience. And, you know, it isn't really enough to to have a great product or service and deliver it effectively and efficiently. You, know, you, you need to do more if you want to create brand loyalists. You have got to turn that into a positive experience. And I can remember a simple uh, episode from my own life. A few years ago, I had to travel to a town that was about two or three hours away to attend a funeral. And I got there a little bit early and there was a Starbucks on the way right before I got to the place where the funeral was being held. And so I just went in and ordered my hot beverage and the barista 
being very friendly, just said, Hey, you know, are you from around here? I told him, no, what are you here for? I told him, got to go to your funeral. And, uh, so he, he finished making my, my beverage and then he handed it to me and I got my wallet out and he said, Nope, just take it. Just, it's yours. And, and so that, you know, I don't remember every instance where I've ever gone into a coffee shop and ordered something to drink, but I remember that one because it became an experience. So, so that's what it starts with starts with an experience and so for that reason it evolves emotion it really brand loyalty is a way we feel about a brand and and that feeling that we get is what turns into a relationship and a relational commitment that is a result of those feelings and and if you get to the very core of that the the root feeling is trust that's the dominant emotional driver when it comes to these brand loyal relationships that customers have with us so what we really need to do is not look at our brands as brands as much as look at them as trust marks, because that's really what these are when it comes to brand loyalty. So let's look at some characteristics of brand loyalty. And, and I think we have to go back to the questions that I showed you at the beginning of our presentation. Um, it's really more than someone who just buys from you repeatedly. It's, it's a customer who intentionally, consciously, repeatedly purchases the same brand. That's one characteristic. But it's more than that. It's someone who seeks the brand out. So it, that, that kind of implies it's, it's more than just a matter of convenience. It's a customer whose opinion of the brand is so high, they're going to be a defender of it. So if anyone attacks that brand or their brand choice, they're going to be saying something on behalf of the brand because they feel like they've become part of the brand. Um, a lot of times there is some connotation of social acceptance when it comes to a customer who's brand loyalty. They feel like their choice is a socially acceptable choice and they like that. It makes them feel good about the brand. And probably at the deepest level, a characteristic of brand loyalty is a customer will remain loyal to a brand even though they consciously understand they are choosing a brand with a product of lesser quality. They may fully understand, I know it's not the best one out there, but it's mine and I choose it. So that's that's kind of the set of characteristics of brand loyalty. So with, with that sort of overview, let's take a look now at measuring brand loyalty. How do we do that? How does that measurement piece work? And I think there's three categories I want to go into, and I'm going to begin with retention. And so often we hear the model of retention, you know, the, the metaphor of a leaky bucket where we've got holes in the bucket, those are the customers we're losing, and then our sales and marketing efforts are adding you know, more water into the top of the bucket. And hopefully you're adding more than you're losing or you're at least keeping it the same. So we understand that model, um, and retention really is the most critical factor to cultivating brand loyalty. If you can't keep the customers you get, you don't really have a hope of getting brand loyalty, and the impact is pretty significant. A, a, this is data from Reichel once again. 5% retention increase also has a big impact on profit, 35 to 95%. So once again, we see the value of doing this, and, and we, we kind of know this intuitively, but now here's the data that tells us this. The good news is it really doesn't take a long time to cultivate loyalty. It, it, it can, but it doesn't have to. But the bad news is the customers who leave you can become instant vocal critics, especially if the, the circumstances of their departure were particularly negative. So there's all kinds of reasons uh, that you don't have to look very far to understand why retention is so very important. So in terms of the metric for that, calculating retention rates really not too difficult. I've got the formula here. To get customer retention rate, what you have to do is take the total number of customers minus the new acquisitions and divide that by the total number of customers in the previous period. So we're, we're working with a period that's a bit arbitrary, but you can choose to do this either monthly, quarterly, or annually. And I think which one you choose really depends on your business and the sales cycle. Um, but whatever it is, and you obviously want to use the same period both for the numerator and denominator to calculate retention rate. And the first time you do it, you're really not going to have a terribly useful metric because you won't have any trend information. It's very possible. You can go out online and find some 
ranges of retention by industry. I, I haven't looked for them, so I don't know if there are any there. But what you really need to do is calculate this retention metric over a period of time and, and compare and look and see where's the trend going. Is it going up or going down? If the first time you do this, you, you have a retention of you know 87%, I don't know whether you should jump up and down and celebrate or whether you should be in despair because that by itself doesn't tell you much until you have a few periods of data. So point is calculate it and calculate it over several periods. But, but retention is certainly something that you should try to measure if you're about boosting and measuring brand loyalty. The second thing would be repurchase. And we've talked a little bit about repurchase already. Um, it's a good loyalty indicator, but we have to understand why is the repurchasing going on? What is the motivation? Because a lot of times repurchasing can be occurring because it's simply convenient. Um, you know, when it comes to this, I'll, I'll tell you a story from a focus group I did a few years ago um, when I was working for a bank and we were trying to understand why people were, you know, choosing this particular bank to make deposits and open certificates, deposit accounts and that type of thing. And, and we were targeting a certain age group and it was senior citizens. And so we had a bunch of them in for a focus group. And, and we asked uh, one attendee, well, why did you choose this bank? And the answer we got was very surprising. And it was simply because when I drive to this bank, when I leave my house, exit my neighborhood, I do not have to turn left to get to this bank. My old bank, I, I quit. I, I stopped going to them. I closed my accounts because I, I moved and I had to turn left on a busy street to get to it. And to get to your bank, I could only have to turn right. And so we, we realized, okay, so the inconvenience of making a left turn is the reason why we had that customer. That's why we've got to understand what is the reason. Sometimes the reason is risk avoidance. Um, you or your solution or someone else's is perceived as less risky. It's always worked. We've always used it. It's never failed us. Uh, and sometimes there truly is devotion to the brand. I, I love the brand, and so I will do everything I can to always repurchase when I can. Don't get me wrong. We love repurchasing activity. But when it comes to measuring brand loyalty, there are different flavors of repurchasing, and I think it's important to try and understand what those are. So calculating repurchase actually is pretty simple. Um, that is, assuming if you have the right systems and data. Uh, so if you've got good systems in place uh, that are showing you who is buying and when they're buying and how much they're buying, then it's not going to be difficult for you to understand what's going on in terms of repurchasing activity. Something else that's worth looking at, though, is the frequency and volume of repurchase because you can have a customer who is just like clockwork repurchasing, but if you see a change in volume, specifically a decrease, that would be a red flag if you could identify that and alert someone to it that maybe you have a, a loyalty issue that you need to go address. So it's it's good to know about who is repurchasing. It's also helpful to know how often uh, because that can be an indicator as well. So I think that's an important metric in terms of repurchasing. And then the last one I want to talk about, the category of metric is is referral. And, and this is the metric that I think most people think about when they talk about brand loyalty, it's, it's probably the most appreciated. And it's also, I would say, the most coveted. It's that category of metric that we want to see go up and we like the best. Uh, so customers generally have to be pretty satisfied with a brand in order to refer. So that's one reason why it's a great indicator. We, we do have to understand, however, there are different levels of referral. Because it's a very different question if you ask me, um, you know, Jerry, who can I go to to get my car repaired? Do you know anyone who repairs cars? Do you know anybody? And I can say, well, sure. I, you know, this place and this place and this place. And, and, and that's a different question than, Jerry, who do you recommend? And so if you're a person like me who has kind of a words have meaning view of life, um, I'll, I'll potentially answer those questions differently. So I think we have to be careful when we're trying to measure uh, referral how we ask the question. Now the measurement is kind of the tricky part um, of the things we've talked about so far. This is the measurement category that's probably the toughest one for us and, and really the only way I know of to do this reliably is through some sort of survey or poll. Quite simply you just have to ask. 
and you've got to do that on a regular basis to understand what's going on in terms of referral. The question is, what do you ask? Well, there's a couple of dimensions potentially. Um, you could go to a new customer and you could say, how did you hear about us? And, and by the way, this can happen very informally. Uh, I know uh, for small businesses, when they are very, very close to their customers, they know who their, their customer base is very, very well. So they know someone that's new. It's very easy to ask at the point of a transaction. Hey, how'd you hear about us? Uh, whether you, you know, log all those responses in a database or just keep a mental catalog, it's still a useful question and still you know, tells you something. The other question that you would like to ask of, of existing customers is, and this is more of the loyalty question of the two, is how likely are you to refer friends to us? And I think that really tells you kind of whether or not they have that trust in your brand and that sentiment and that feeling about you that makes them willing to do a referral. So to find that out, again, the only way I know to do this reliably is you've got to ask. A lot of businesses have established um, what we call sort of register surveys at, at, at a consumer setting where you buy from a register, you get a receipt and on the receipt is a link and the link lets you as a customer go and take a survey off and there's a potential to win something. So you see a lot of customers doing that, but however you do it, you're going to have to go collect that data through some sort of surveying effort. But that, that's the, the third of the three metrics that I think is important when it comes to measuring brand loyalty. Let's talk now about how brand loyalty kind of works in the digital age because the, the internet and social media really magnifies the impact uh, either way, either the favorable or the negative impact of social media. It just really kind of accelerates. So if someone's very happy with you, they have all these channels and mechanisms they can use to talk about that and, and often will, or, or if they're very unhappy with you to do the same. And, uh, you know, the, the statistics have been consistent through the years that the likelihood or propensity for an unhappy customer to exercise their right to say something to the world, to anyone who will listen, is far, far greater than it is for someone who's happy to go out and share their joy and their brand loyalty with people they know. So the, the, the arithmetic actually works against you when it comes to unhappy customers. And that's why you've got to make such an effort to create brand loyalists. Um, and the other piece, just the reality is simply this, it's so much easier for customers to assess your brand worthiness completely outside your influence. And this, it, it's really a good thing, but, but it's troubling for some businesses because they, they understand all the money I spend on marketing and, and the things that I do to try and influence customers, um, they're going and self-educating and they're making decisions and drawing conclusions completely outside my uh, awareness and seemingly my ability to influence. And so that's just the reality of the world in which we live now with all the information available online. This is particularly true when it comes to social media because it gives customers a voice. But we understand that it also is a great referral tool. So, you know, you, you can have different points of view about social media. You can love it or you can hate it. But, but here's the truth about it. Brands that are serious about cultivating loyalty cannot ignore social media. Uh, and I understand why some of them do. There's a fear factor that if we go, you know, set up a Facebook page or you know, Twitter or something else, uh, unhappy customers are just going to use that. They're going to get on that social media soapbox and they're going to just, you know, air their grievances for everyone to hear. And so we're just, we're not going to go there. That's, that's kind of like burying your head in the sand. And, and it actually, I think is a far more dangerous thing to do than trying to take ownership and curate some of those conversations, because it is true that customers will express displeasure through social media channels that you curate. That's just the reality. But you have to understand that every time someone does that, that becomes a recovery opportunity for you. And, and all the data you want to go look for and find will tell you that it's very powerful to take an unhappy customer, recover, do something to recover that relationship, and, and they very quickly sometimes do a 180 and become brand advocates because you went out of the way to fix their problem, to help them out, or even just to listen. So 
social media is a very powerful tool for cultivating, measuring that loyalty. Um, you, you have to understand that these conversations are taking place whether you are curating social media channels or not. So if people are bashing you on social media, they're going to do it whether you have a Facebook page, LinkedIn group, a Twitter handle. It doesn't matter. They're going to do it. And so you might as well invest the time and the effort uh, to, to do this and to the vigilance to just monitor the discussions and be responsive to it. So that's kind of my, my opinion on social media. It's a very important tool in doing all this. So let's segue into the action plan and uh, would love to take questions if you have any. When it comes to doing this, you first thing you have to do is establish the culture because brand loyalty is a product of a service-oriented culture and culture comes from the top of the company. Uh, the, the leader of a company or an organization cannot just issue an edict that says, yeah, we want to have loyal customers, so serve them well, and then not model that and not live it and not make it a reality. Um, some of the parameters that are very important when it comes to service culture include quality, and, and quality certainly in terms of the offering, but, but really quality in terms of the interaction, the interaction with the customers. That's where the quality needs to be. Uh, responsiveness, so when there is an issue, that you're quick to address it, you're quick to respond, you're quick to listen, and then certainly empowerment as well. You, you cannot have this culture that yields brand loyalty if you have not trusted and empowered your customer-facing employees to use their brains and do things that make sense to keep customers happy. So that's the culture piece. The other thing you have to do is simply define loyalty, and I, I couldn't think of a more loyal animal than a golden retriever to use as my icon for this. But, but when you do this, you have to first understand all right, exactly who is being served by you and your company that's services and products. Without understanding who that is, um, you, you can't really do this well. You've got to have a deep, deep understanding and knowledge of your customers. And, and you have to do that because you've got to know how they define quality. What are their terms for quality? How do they define when they're satisfied or when they're not? Your definitions are important, but they don't matter as much as the customer's definitions for these things. So if you're not operating on their definitions, then you're not doing it right. And so with that, then you take those and other things to really understand what are their relationship drivers with you? What led them into a relationship and what keeps them into a relationship? And so without knowing these things, you're not going to be able to get the level of brand loyalty that you'd like to have. So that's the second step in this action plan. The third step is to influence it. Do what you can. And one of the best ways is to listen. Have great mechanisms in place both to listen and to respond. And companies that do this really well are like Ritz-Carlton. Uh, all of their employees carry around, um, it used to be, you know, a pad and pencil. They may have gone electronic now, but uh, e even the, the lowest level employee in a Ritz-Carlton, if they have a customer encounter and the customer expresses anything, a, a, a preference, a wish, a, a praise, a complaint, it gets captured, it gets logged, it goes into a system. They have great listening processes and mechanisms for response. Um, the other thing that's great influencers just to reward current customers. And, and when you see the term reward, you start thinking about, oh, we've got to put a system in place to you know, record purchases and accumulate points and give them prizes later. You know, that's if you want to do that, sure. But, but when it comes to rewarding, this can be something very simple and cultural, as simple as just training your staff and your customer-facing employees to express gratitude. Say thank you. That matters a lot to customers. Um, excel at meeting needs. You know, be better than your competition. That's kind of a marketing fundamental. And then the other thing you have to do is you've got to communicate about how you're creating value. You can't assume that the things you're doing are going to get discovered by everyone. You, you have to kind of go on the offensive when it comes to PR to make sure that you're you know, saying things about how you're serving customers well and, and how your brand loyalty is, is affected by that. And then lastly, you have to measure loyalty. So you've got to define your metrics. We've talked about three metrics categories. You've got to collect and track the data. And then you've got to report on the brand loyalty metrics because that creates an accountability piece that's very important in this whole process. We have a tool 
that we just created called the Brand Loyalty Dashboard. This tool is currently free. If you will go out to the Demand Metric website and, and go to our premium content link and select free content, this is one of the tools you can get for free. So even if you're not a member of Demand Metric, um, you can still go get this for free, and I encourage you to go do that. This is pre-populated with a sample set of, of uh, metrics that you can track. Uh, you can change these if you want, but it's just a way to help you organize your tracking effort. Uh, if you use this tool, it will produce some nice reporting graphics for you. Here's a couple that I'm sharing with you, and I've once again put my email. If, you, if it's easier for you to just send me an email and say, Jerry, I'd like that tool, I'll send it to you. Another resource that we have that's, uh, I believe, it may be free, I don't know, but I'll give it to you. I'll send it to you. Almost all the content of this webinar uh, is captured in a how-to guide that I wrote called the Brand Loyalty Advantage. It's about six pages. It talks through all the stuff in a bit more detail. So if you'd like that as well, once again, you can go to our website or you can send me an email. We'll get that to you. So let's summarize because we're at our 30 minutes. I apologize for going a bit over. Brand loyalty, it's an emotional thing. It's an attachment that you nurture through quality service and through dialogue with the customer. Uh, cultivating brand loyalty is going to take some time, probably other resources as well. You're going to have to invest and make a commitment to doing it. You're going to get a return, though, and the return's pretty big in terms of profit and lifetime value of customer. So the business case is definitely there, as you saw from the data I shared with you. Finally, and this, I think, is maybe the most important thing. The businesses that think, you know, we're just going to rely on product advantages and great marketing promotions to attract and retain buyers, you will always put yourself at a disadvantage to competitors who are really good at creating loyal customers. And to me, that is the reason right there. So hope that is helpful. I would love to answer any questions if you have any. Um, so let me know. If you want to type a question in, or, or if you would prefer just to interact with me later via email, that would be fine too. Uh, so I'll give you just another minute to think if you would like to ask a question. I'm monitoring our question box, and uh, perhaps I did such a thorough job of answering your questions, you don't have any. So uh, if there aren't any questions, I will like to close now and just say I appreciate you spending this uh, now 35 minutes with us. Um, oh, wait, there's a question. Let me uh, talk about that. Uh, brand ambassadors. Yeah, let me let me repeat my email. It's simply jerry at demandmetric.com. And let me address this question for those of you who are able to stay. Uh, Vinny asked this question. You spoke about brand ambassadors. Can you speak to employee ambassadors? And, you know, Vinny, I think the the line or the distinction between them is 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 blurred. I mean, they're very close. Um, I, I think developing brand loyal customers begins with employees. You, you cannot do this well if you don't have the culture in a company that also enables and encourages and supports your own employees from being ambassadors too. And so that's why I like organizations who have uh, benefits set up to encourage and allow and even perhaps in some cases give their employees, you know, company product or discounts to have the employees be users because that equips them to do this really well. So I think that's a good point. Uh, we have another question. Once someone puts a bad review up, do you think it's worthwhile to contact that person and try and resolve the problem? And isn't that bad review up for all time? Um, well, that's a great question, Mindy. Um, the answer is no, it doesn't have to be up for all time. But it's going to be up there for part of the time. I, I recommend a couple of things. One is a quick response. Don't let it sit there for a long time. That's why you have to be vigilant monitoring uh, social media or any other listening posts where customers are airing grievances. So when you see something come up, you've got to get on it immediately. Uh, if it is a complaint or, or something negative that was, uh, was posted on a social media channel that you curate, you do have the ability to, you know, to delete it or select that, turn it off. Uh, you, you have some control over some of those. If it was put somewhere else, then you can't do that. But, but you may not necessarily want to because if you're able to recover, you're able to create a satisfactory outcome for that customer, 
one of the things you should do is ask that customer, hey, we're glad we're able to resolve this for you. W would you be willing to go back and share that in the same way you initially shared your concern? Then that becomes a very positive thing for you. You can turn it around. So that's, that's what I think you have to do. Um, a question about the materials. You will get the materials. Um, I'll send an email out sometime later this week. And what are ways to reward advocates referring individuals? You know, a lot of people think you've got to spend money to do this. Um, you don't have to spend a lot of money. Quite honestly, customers who do referrals, you'll find most of them aren't doing it because they expect to get something in return. They're doing it because they truly believe in your brand. And, and so if you do something as simple, you or someone on the staff, as simple as write a thank you note. Hey, we got a new customer because of you. We're so grateful that you feel that way about our brand. Thanks for supporting us and our brand. That goes a long, long way towards reinforcing that relationship. And of course, it's at your discretion, depending on the business. You can do other things as well. You can, you know, give them a gift certificate to Starbucks for a free coffee. You can give them a discount on a future purchase, but you don't have to. Just saying thank you and acknowledging that uh, goes a long way towards keeping those brand loyalists and growing them. So those are great questions. I'm glad that you all had those. Uh, if you have other questions, please do get in touch with me. Once again, the email is jerry at demandmetric.com. And with that, we will end our session today. Thanks once again for joining us. If there's something we can do to help you, please let us know. Goodbye, everybody.